Tonight, violence in Dorchester. Police say that a teenage boy was killed. And shooting spree has now left three people wounded. It's one of the most violent weekends in the city's history. State Police Boston recorded emergency 510. My, my wife's been shot, I've been shot. Uh, Where are you right now, sir? Can you indicate to me? No, I don't know. I don't know. He, drove, he made us go to an abandoned area. Okay, sir. We heard it over the radio. We had a pregnant white female from the suburbs uh, shot in the head, and we had her husband that was shot. And he was in critical condition at the time. What's your name, sir? Stewart, Chuck Stewart. Chuck? Yeah. Hang in with me, Chuck. Can you hear me? Chuck? My wife is suffering. She's suffering. Chuck, I'm We responded to the scene. We were two of dozens of cops. A brutal attack on a pregnant woman and her husband as they left. There'd be at least one or two shootings a night back then. But that was a different type of shooting. We were mostly dealing with young black males who were involved in gangs and drugs. Here you have a woman in a prenatal visit at one of the premier hospitals in the city of Boston, carjacked and robbed and murdered. See who did this? One guy, two guys, one. Right, what do you look like? It really exploded that maybe Boston was an unsafe place. A nightmare story of random crime and violent death. Millions of television viewers across the United States listened in horror. Every day you and your family and your friends are not victims of crime. The odds will increase. You will be. We feel vulnerable because we are vulnerable. And the mayor came right out and said, I want everybody down here. I instructed the police commissioner of the city of Boston and the police department to be as aggressive as they ever have been before. Boston police are looking for one black male in connection One with of the most intense police manhunts in the city's history. Searching anyone who looks like a gang member or drug dealer, largely in the black neighborhoods. The efforts, investigative efforts, were concentrated in the Mission Hill housing development. Stops, arrests, and uh, summonses for everything from drinking in public to small amounts of narcotics because the concept was shake as many trees as you can until we start getting information on who committed this heinous crime. The city was amazingly violent. Since September 1st, 14 murders in Boston. The neighborhood was essentially held hostage by the drug dealers. I and a few other individuals every day we would tour the neighborhood. I was on the streets the night that Carol Stewart died. Up and down the streets, you saw the blue lights. They were grabbing up young black males. When I first came to Boston to be a pastor, I had family members and friends warn me, be very careful, stay in the communities of color because it's a, a very racist city. Massive police presence searched for the black male Charles Stewart. I remember driving in maybe two days after the woman was shot and killed and seeing police officers lining up these guys from Mission Hill. They would pull the pants down, they would be very obtrusive in their searches. It really made me feel very fearful about who I was as a black man. There are reports of a possible break in the case. 39-year-old William Willie Bennett is considered a prime suspect. In the he was a, an individual that had been involved with law enforcement many times, violent crimes, armed robberies, things like that. The initial information was that his nephew was kind of spouting off in front of a couple of other teenage males saying, yeah, it was my Uncle Willie that uh, uh, killed those two white people. It's just a mad dog running amok, and society has to be protected here. It was all this media about how dangerous the inner city is. It was almost tied into the character of, of, of black people. The number of police officers that were assigned to the investigation was something that you would never see in the mission projects. There was a lot of feedback from the community that, well, wait a minute, we've got a lot of African-American kids being shot around the city, how come we never got this kind of response before, and they were right. You had this confluence where you had all of this violent activity happening within the inner city, and you had the racial issues that we had to deal with on top of that. Last October, Stewart... And the Charles Stewart case uh, sort of put that on grand illustration.
There is an unsettling mystery tonight surrounding Boston businessman Charles Stewart. You'll recall. I received a phone call from someone that Charles Stewart just jumped off the bridge um, and, uh, and that he's dead. And I was like, you're kidding me. Yesterday afternoon, there was a dramatic turn of events which uh, focused on uh, Mr. Charles Stewart as a suspect. There had been, we were now told, no black gunman after all, no robbery. A racially charged murder that had police frisking young blacks at random and legislators crying for the death penalty was instantly transformed into an ugly domestic killing. It made unavoidably obvious what people had been saying all along, which was when there's even a suggestion that a black man may be involved, the rules change. Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan have been hit by a series of shootings, stabbings, and beatings. Much Two of the violence... teenagers were gunned down near a Roxbury playground. Violence started to careen out of control in the late 80s. It was just shooting happening all over the place. And we were doing, as clergy, more funerals of teenagers. Boston has seen a horrific increase in the number of violent crimes committed by and against its young black men. And increasingly, these crimes are being committed by children, teenage gangs. And you can go to any emergency room, and you would see on gurneys young black men, usually Latino men, dying. When we moved into Four Corners, we had no idea that young men had held the neighborhood hostage. The majority of adults were terrified by the neighborhood. The city of Boston and the police department was denying that we had a gang problem. The intelligence unit at that time was concentrating more on the traditional mafia or Irish gangs, and nobody was really keeping track of these street gangs. This kid's saying, you shot him, Lawan. So if you didn't shoot him, you better have something to say to me. These are kids between the ages of 16 and 24 that played basketball together, went to middle school together, and all of a sudden were shooting back and forth. You know, we seem to be locking up the same individuals over and over again. We were making numerous arrests for drugs and guns. The judge would set conditions of probation, such as curfews. How come you out this time of night? Huh? Oh, no. But that was kind of the end of it for us, because it wasn't our job to check on those conditions of probation. It was the probation officers. I kind of get the feeling from you that it's my fault that you're here, and that's not true. The kids would come into the office, and uh, they'd be talking about things that they had done at night. All we had to do was ask questions. Are you doing OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We only worked 8.30 to 4.30. That's all we had to do. 4.30, get in your car and go home. You had some of our more violent offenders that nobody was checking. We're just going to keep on doing it, and 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 doing it. Ain't no stopping us. The gangs use street names. Humboldt, Intervale, Castlegate. I grew up on Castlegate. It started off as just a bunch of friends. They would call us doughboys, because that's what we wanted to do, get money, look cute for the girls. And we started selling um, weed and we got involved with these guys from New York. And they showed us that we could corner the market with this new drug called crack. This was one of the main areas we hung in. And you ever been to Stop and Shop right before a snowstorm? And it's a long line? That's how it was for crack. They came and they came. Now you can imagine, I'm still young. That was the most money I've ever seen in my life. We got involved with somebody from New York who got us guns. We had protection in our little world. We was on top of it. Romero Holiday was public enemy number one at one time up on Castlegate Road. Sold drugs, very violent. There was ongoing feuds at the time between the Castlegate crew and the crew up at Humboldt Ave. Every day we went up there and we shot at them. Every day. We would literally, did you go up there today? No, come on, let's go up there. Every day. What did we call it? Putting them on a schedule. And we used to say, you want to put them on a schedule too? If you mess with me, if you deal with me, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you and anybody else that deals with you. We were having broad daylight shootings. There was a number of innocent people caught in crossfires. 
Dolly and Tiffany Moore was a young girl that was sitting on the mailbox at the corner of Humboldt and Homestead and caught a stray round, hitting her in the head and killing her. Her mother had sent her down south to avoid the violence that was happening in the community. And she had come up to visit her mother. And this one visit, you know, um, she was killed. You know, we were there on scene first and, uh, you know, watching the life flow out of a 12-year-old little girl. You're thinking, you know, this is a child that lives in the same city that my son lives in. And, um, you know, it's just unacceptable. What is going on in this city, and particularly in District B, is open warfare. We pay our taxes, we do our work, we send our kids to school, now we're demanding equal protection under the law. We thought, like everybody else, that this was a generation that was going to be lost to jail and violence, An -year -old boy is and that they were hopeless, and that the only method that we needed to deal with them was through enforcement. Police have begun to stop and search suspected gang members for weapons. Everybody put your hands on the wall. Everybody get your hands on the wall. I know where you live. We were taking weapons off the street and getting cases on people that were selling drugs. I made it my business during that time. Often, if I was driving home and I saw the police questioning somebody, I'd get out. We don't play. Spread your legs. It was very loud, very aggressive in many cases. Disturbing allegations of cops arbitrarily pulling down people's pants. There were people within the community who supported it. The problem is all kinds of innocent kids who had nothing to do with it got swept up in it as well. We're all just either perpetrators or potential perps to you. That's all we are. I need to talk to you. A growing number of young people would come to me asking for assistance because I was doing outreach. I get with you to talk about the other. And so I started visiting the court five days a week, advocating for kids. I remember walking by the courthouse, and uh, he'd look at us, and we'd look at him, and he'd pff, and we'd pff him back. It was us against them. I had received reports that police had circulated the rumor that I was actually a drug dealer. This black clergyman was selling drugs in the black community. The police department was dealing with racial issues. The prime suspect in his wife. That culminated when Charles Stewart killed his wife and blamed it on a black man. It felt like the final straw. We've got a toxic racial dynamic happening right here and there's no denying it. There's no getting around it. You have dealt us an injustice. Anger is too mild a word for what these black community leaders express today. This time, however, the night riding was not the action of white-robed bigots, but instead the actions of a mayor, Mayor Raymond Flynn, That's who right. so That's quickly right. jumped to conclusions. Yes, it was so blatant, it was played out in real time and the whole nation was watching. The most disturbing findings are those of public strip searches. There is no excuse for forcing young men to lower their trousers or for police officer to search inside their underwear on public streets and hallways. By 1990, the shootings and murders had increased. The stop and frisk resulted in more seizures of firearms, resulted in more arrests, more incarcerations, didn't change the violence one bit, and the relationships with the African-American community and the police was deteriorating quickly. We were kind of like shoveling sand against the tide, and it was like, nothing's getting better. It's getting worse. Kids are dying all hours of the day. Kids that were on probation. I had 65 kids shot to death in five years. Shot to death, and they were all one color. And nobody cared. The young man that I had had on probation was shot to death. And his mom said, why did you let them kill my baby? And she started to vent. And she started to, to hit me. I let her. I let her. And afterwards, I thought, you know, she was right. She was right. I thought I needed to understand the culture that all this violence is coming out of. And uh, it became clear to me that no matter how many programs I would build for youth to come into the church, they weren't coming in. 
I was working with some other ministers who also felt a real concern about what was happening with young people. The event I think that really crystallized it for a lot of us was the Morning Star incident. A funeral at a church very much involved in the community was crashed when some of the guys lost it when they saw somebody from a rival gang. And a massive fight and turmoil breaks loose in the church, turning the complete service out and terrorizing everyone in the church. The boy was stabbed nine times before a shocked congregation. The message I thought that Morning Star gave was we had to come out of the four walls of our sanctuary and meet the youth where they were. Every Friday night, we were in the street, in the most violent neighborhoods. To see clergy doing patrols was a big deal. You had never seen black clergy patrols in the city of Boston. But what we found out as we were walking the streets that the youth weren't the only people watching us. We would pass Reverend Ray Hammond, Reverend Eugene Rivers, Reverend Jeff Brown, and at nighttime, the black clergy and the police were the only adult males that were really out there in the community. So we started to have meetings with them, you know, not about the state of policing and, or anything like that, but it was about the neighborhoods. Jeff Brown became a fixture in our building. Gene Rivers was a fixture in our building. We said, hey, we got to try something different. These kids all wanted to please their probation officers because violation of probation meant they could be incarcerated. Probation officers didn't work nights, and the police officers didn't have the jurisdiction to knock on doors checking conditions of probation. And we said, look, we want to have the probation officers start riding with us at night. While police have constitutional restraints on conducting searches, probation officers do not. Is Antoine home? Do you have anything I don't want to find? Do you have a stash in here or anything? If they weren't home or if they were in places where they weren't supposed to be, we were going to get them violated so we could get them off the street. How are you? What are you doing? He has a bar cut You right came just to walk your girlfriend home? No, that's not The longer we were out there, the more I learned about the nature of, nature of the neighborhood. How long do you think it's going to take you to get home? 10 minutes. Oh, I think less where your heart's beating right yeah. now, right? When you went into the houses, you know, you learned that they might be all that out on the street, but at home, they were the ones putting food on the table, making sure the youngins get up for school. So we started to get a bigger picture of that this wasn't a group of lost souls. It was always separate. Now, all of a sudden, we're joined. And what we were doing, we were changing names, information, and intelligence. And then we were working with David Kennedy from Harvard. I decided to try to do something practical, to try to figure out what was going on with the killing in Boston and what, if anything, might be done about it. There was this quite amazing coalition that had come together. It was Boston cops, prosecutors, probation officers, and outreach workers. We put a city map of Boston on a table Each one and said, start somewhere and show us where these crews are and how they're operating. And we confirmed what they already knew. It was kids who were perpetrators one day, victims the next, and all heavily involved in the criminal justice system. So really, at the end of the day, it was a small group that were driving the majority of violence. And if the police department didn't know them, probation knew them. Among all of us, we knew every one of them. Every crew has one or two people who really drive things. This is humble, buddy. It was maybe 300 people. The political and media discourse had been about these massive issues, the crack epidemic, cultures of violence. And what this said was, hey, look, this is 300 people whose names we know. And suddenly, it began to seem like you could maybe do something. The Youth Violence Strike Force had done this operation on a group in Dorchester. We wanted those guns taken off the street, and we just said, look it, we're gonna be down here until the violence stops. We're gonna make your life miserable. We're gonna use every legal lever possible to shut you down. And the most important thing is that you are always following it up with, it's not about the open beer that I'm arresting you, it's about the violence. They said to them, 
you want this to stop, put your guns down. And members of this crew actually delivered brown paper bags of guns to the steps of the gang unit. We took that and we built it into a violence prevention strategy. What do we do? Let's bring them in the courthouse. What are we gonna do? We'll talk to them. We're tired of seeing kids buried. We're tired of the violence. You see me. A number of speakers would get up and talk. We are here to tell you that if the violence doesn't stop, we will be bringing the full authority of the government down on you. But we also were delivering a message that if the violence stops, there are other options for you. And we will help you to get back into school, to get you some job mentoring, to get you out of this lifestyle. We know who you are, we know what's going on. Do you want to spend the rest of your life in a federal prison? Your choice, your decision. Make a smart one. We'll help you, but you've got to meet us halfway. This isn't about locking kids up. This is about you growing up. This is about you giving the opportunity to be the best you can be. I'm from the youth violence strike. There were a small number of people that needed to be taken off the street. For everybody's good. Does everyone have a copy of the Issues of crime are too big for the police alone. I looked at the clergy as a measurement of are we doing things in the right way from a different perspective. It wasn't a popular thing because people would feel you're a minister and you should believe that every child should be saved. And I would say in response, I believe that with all my heart, every child should be saved. It's just that for some kids, they need a prison ministry. And we're all standing here together. Clergy was the same message we delivered, except they would add the caveat, we love you. We'll help you if you let us, and we'll stop you if you make us. Go out there and tell your friends. And we stopped. How you doing, man? How you doing, Pastor Hammond? How does everything? Pastor Hammond would say, you guys ain't, y'all ain't that bad. Y'all just make bad decisions. And he made us understand that it was nothing wrong with being wrong, it's staying wrong. We're serious about this. this then he was like, you can come to my church, you can visit me, you can call me anytime you want, giving out his number. Yeah, we're still, still working at Whenever he came around, he would ask about me, and that meant a lot. We got Romero working with MDC, and um, when we were all playing hockey with the police team, Romero was the kid driving the Zamboni. We'd have our hockey bags carrying them over to the bench with guns in them, and you know Romero would be like, oh, just leave them there, I'll watch them for you. I think it took a lot to just to trust that much of me. Them knowing how I was showed me that they seen something in me that I didn't see. So maybe I'm not the monster that everybody thought I was. One of my low points was this Tiffany Moore situation. It was my call that made us go up there every single day and shoot at these people. I didn't directly go up there and do it. You get what I'm saying? If I knew the right decisions and the right calls to make, none of this would have ever happened. are calling it the Boston Miracle. A city once torn apart by racial tension and violence is now a model of crime prevention. Boston. We became the national poster children for successful programs. Zero tolerance policy. On ABC the came, CBS came, NBC came. Streetwalkers program. Youth gun crime is an epidemic. Media, when they like to tell stories, they like to do it through the lens of like one person or one life. They would say it was probation visiting people at home. It was federal prosecution for gun crimes. The black ministers talking directly with guys on the street. The big picture was lost. It was putting them on notice that the violence was going to bring comprehensive legal attention. It was moving in social services, and it was moving in what we call the community moral voice. What really made Boston special it was really everybody being very willing to work with one another. And Boston proves that we can take the streets back of our country. But when Bill Clinton came to Boston, when Newsweek came a-calling, things started to sort of shake um, the coalition. I was in the grocery store, and I looked, 
at the checkout and I see Gene Rivers' face, you know, at every single checkout counter. And I remember going into Dorchester to see Eugene. And Eugene was wearing sunglasses, like, inside. And he was referring to himself in the third person. And, um, you know, it, it just changed everything. Reverend Eugene Rivers is on the front lines of... One of the unavoidable aspects of all movements is that somebody's going to end up being the signature person. Their approach... That's a fairly standard thing, right? As the mythology about the Boston miracle grew, there was this vicious fight for credit. Everybody stood up and said, I'm responsible for this. There were started to be resentments amongst the clergy, the police, probation, within each individual group. It wasn't about the violence. It was about marketing, if you will. And then some people made their careers off of it, uh, from the clergy to the academia to the police. We sort of lost sight, lost our way. It stopped being a movement. Now, ladies, the daughter of a church plant... All of us underestimate the difficulty of maintaining collaborations and partnerships just in general. With or without media attention, with or without dollars involved, 150 homicides will focus you. Harder to keep focus when it's down to 30. fourth shooting in Kalamazoo this weekend. Nine people have been shot here in the city in the last five days. Again, three homicides this summer. 2014 was when we had our highest number of shootings. Community relationships between law enforcement and people in neighborhoods aren't, aren't really good. So we wouldn't get cooperation. We would get no information on the shooter. And we had a 13-year-old kid that was shot and killed. It was the second time the 13-year-old was shot in six weeks. He got hit in the back by gunfire on April 6th, but nobody was arrested. Traditional policing methods did not prevent it, and so he said, what can we do to, to do something different? We have several shootings to discuss. And that's really the community came to us and said, hey, are there other things? And someone in them heard about the David Kennedy model. I run the National Network for Safe Communities. And one of our convictions is communities need policing. They just don't need the kind of policing they've been getting. People deserve not to be afraid of the state. In the most dangerous places, hardly anybody's dangerous. And there are ways to engage them that can be very effective. We looked at the guys who are actually pulling the trigger. And we came up with 22 individuals out of the entire city. We talked to those individuals. We know who you are. But in turn, we also provide them with phone numbers and names of people that can help them. I bring understanding to the room because I sold a lot of drugs, did a lot of violence. And I'm telling them, the cops know who you are, man, and they want you to make a decision. I'm here to offer you a way out, and, and sometimes you need a person like me to explain that. A lot of times people have never had a positive contact with a police officer. They've never had somebody show up at their door and say, I really want to see you get a job. I really want to see you be successful. Here we are six months after none of them have been arrested for an act of violence. That was shocking. <laughs> when I started, I was the poster child for uh, traditional policing. You know, you need to stop cars and you needed to get guns off the street and you need to get drugs off the street and drug dealers off the corners. That's what we did. Hi, nice to meet you. The hardest thing with any law enforcement is just changing the culture of an organization. If you just do traditional policing, you start to get jaded and think that everybody in this neighborhood is a bad person, everybody in this neighborhood is a criminal, because that's all you're dealing with. So you're good at geometry? I never thought that I would be where I am now, where we spend more time building those relationships and working with the community. It changes the way you look at your neighborhood. You start to realize that, you know, 99% of the people in this neighborhood are good folks. Lots and lots of cities are doing it now, but there is no national strategy. 
to address what we now know is addressable. Have a great day, man. All right. It's not perfect. It's actually relatively easy to put something like this together. It's very difficult to keep it going. We know things that make a really big difference. I was looking for Sierra. She's not here? All right, we'll tell her officer Nick said hi. All right, have a good night. And it was Boston that created that understanding. We built relationships. There was a level of trust that was earned over time. My boss, I figured out, was the neighborhood. I worked with the chief, I worked with the commissioner, but I worked for everybody I didn't know. That was the flip for me. The miracle was not that the crime rate went down. The miracle was that the adults figured out how to collaborate in the interest of the young people. That was the miracle.